Greetings, good morning, and welcome to the Wilson Center. My name is Benjamin Gadan. I direct our Latin America program. I'm so thrilled to have you here with us today for this special event. I'm delighted to see a full auditorium, enormous interest online in this event. I'm happy but not surprised, given the enthusiasm generated by the election of Santiago Pena and his visit here to Washington this week. As many of you know, this is not an easy time in the Americas, particularly in Latin America and in parts of South America. After a decade of economic struggles and the disproportionately negative social, economic, and public health consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, throughout much of the region, public opinion shows frustration with public institutions, traditional political parties, traditional political figures. In fact, the ruling coalition seemed to lose practically every election throughout the Americas. Paraguay, however, is a major exception to that trend. Its conservative Colorado party has ruled Paraguay almost interrupt uninterruptedly since the late 1940s. And in April of this year, the party's presidential candidate, our special guest today, the former finance minister, Santiago Pena, a former senior official in the Central Bank and at the International Monetary Fund, a longtime friend of the Wilson Center, easily won his five-year term. His party won majorities in the Senate and lower house and controls nearly every governor's office in the country. I had the privilege and honor of meeting with then candidate Pena in Asuncion late last year. And it was clear in my conversations with him, with senior lawmakers, with private sector and civil society leaders, that there is enormous optimism in Paraguay these days. The country is preparing to renegotiate its historic treaty with Brazil that governs the sharing of revenue generated by the gigantic Itaipu Dam. In fact, I believe President Pena's next international trip is to Brasilia to start these important discussions. The new agreement could potentially make available even more affordable clean energy for manufacturers looking to reduce their dependence upon China and take advantage of Paraguay's steady economic management its young and affordable workforce, and its consistently low and competitive tax system. The end of a prolonged drought has been a godsend to Paraguay's ranchers and soy farmers who help feed much of the world. The IMF expects economic growth to exceed 4% this year and nearly reach that level again in 2024 in Paraguay. Not a small achievement given the headwinds I've described earlier facing many economies in South America and elsewhere. Investors are building a $4 billion pulp mill outside Concepcion, Paraguay, upriver from the capital city of Asuncion. It's the biggest private project in Paraguay's history and could be the start of an entire new industry, one that has thrived in neighboring Uruguay. Paraguay is also hoping to establish a green hydrogen industry, and it has already taken important steps in that direction, a priority for the new administration, and one of many environmental and sustainability measures that are on Paraguay's governing agenda at this point. Paraguay is constructing a highway known as the, Bio, the, the Bioceanic Corridor through the Gran Chaco in the north that will permit exporters in Brazil and Paraguay to access Asian markets more easily through ports in northern Chile. Despite these considerable tailwinds, President Peña does have his work cut out for him. Paraguay's trade agenda is held hostage by the failure of the Mercosur bloc to negotiate new major international agreements, including an exceedingly long delayed proposed deal with the European Union. Though the drought has concluded mercifully for Paraguay's farmers, climate change continues to threaten Paraguay's agricultural sector, its main economic engine as the country attempts an industrialization process. Income inequality and social exclusion remain daunting challenges for anyone leading Paraguay. The country is a close ally of the United States and Taiwan at a time of rising Chinese influence in South America. And perhaps the biggest challenge for the new administration is the need to continue strengthening rule of law institutions to control public corruption, combat organized crime, and guarantee an efficient and independent judiciary both to assure justice for Paraguayans and to continue to build the country's international image and attract foreign investment, including nearshoring investment. President Peña, in his inaugural address, pledged to do just that and more, 
the reforms that would improve transparency and provide reassurances to investors, both domestic and international, including major U.S. multinational corporations looking at opportunities in Paraguay to take advantage of all of the conditions we've already discussed and we'll hear much more about. I'm excited to hear about President Peña's agenda in his conversation with our President and CEO, Ambassador Mark Green, shortly. But first, I have the honor to introduce our distinguished fellow, Ivan Duque, the former president of Colombia, who will talk to us not only about the importance of President Peña's successes for Paraguayans, but for South America, Latin America, the Western Hemisphere, and the world, as what will occur in Asuncion and elsewhere in Paraguay has important implications and consequences far beyond the center of South America. Please join me in welcoming President Peña, President Duque, and our CEO and President Mark Green for today's discussion. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, President Peña. It's a great privilege and honor to have you at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Ambassador Green, dear ministers, it is a great honor to welcome you, and it is a great honor to express that your presence today is a great opportunity for the Center and for the Washington, D.C. think tank diplomacy community. President Peña, many people know where Paraguay is located. But too much people do not know the geostrategic importance of Paraguay, and we have to highlight it today with a louder voice. <laughs> Paraguay, as we talked some minutes ago, it's larger in size than Germany. And it has a population that it's a little bit less than 7 million people. That means that Paraguay has a tremendous possibility due to its land, but also because Paraguay has one of the highest productivity per hectares in this hemisphere when it comes to the provision of food security. At the same time, Paraguay is a country that is 100% relied on renewable energy, and it has the possibility to use the land and to use also the capacity to absorb great amount of light in the course of the day, to use that possibility to become one of the largest producers of green hydrogen. And at the same time, Paraguay represents one of the highest percentage of exports per GDP in Latin America and the Caribbean. So saying all this is a way to showcase the possibilities. But it's also very important to say that Paraguay is highly committed to a very ambitious environmental agenda. President Peña has given continuity to a vision, a state vision, so that Paraguay can reach 30% of its territory as protected areas in what is called the 30 by 30 agenda. President Peña will be tomorrow present as a special guest at the ICCF dinner. And as you well know, the ICCF work in DC with partners like the Woodrow Wilson Center has been able to highlight environmental leadership in our region. And for sure, Paraguay with a low carbon agricultural vision, the possibility to compromise and achieve the 30 by 30, its transition also to becoming a green hydrogen exporter and supplier, and being one of the cleanest energy matrix in the world allows Paraguay to speak with the contundency of success and the contundency of results. President Peña, you are also committed to security, to trade, to fiscal prudence, and you have a vision of a business-friendly administration. Why this is important for the center and for the freedom and prosperity strategy that we have designed through Latin America and the Caribbean. We have seen in many countries the arrival of demagoguery, polarization, and populism. But you, in fact, show that there is a clear possibility of defeating those principles that some are trying to embrace to create turmoil in the region, demonstrating 
that with fiscal prudence, pro-business, environmental sound policy, things can be much better. You've only been in office for 60 days, but there's a lot of hope on your administration. The Woodrow Wilson Center, it's one of the biggest treasures that we have in this community in Washington, D.C., as a member of the Smithsonian Society, as a nonpartisan think and do tank, and most importantly, as a center that has the possibility to influence policy in Capitol Hill. We know your voice and your leadership, your presence in the city during the next three days is going to allow many members of Congress and members of the diplomatic community to see the opportunities that Paraguay brings to the table and to also demonstrate that there are governments in this region that are clearly pro-U.S. relationship-oriented, that are pro-Israel, but also pro-peace in the Middle East, that are also pro-having solutions that deter risks in Asia, and that you have a pro-Latin American vision, not marked by ideology, but marked by reason and by common sense. With all that said, President Peña, we are delighted to welcome you. We want you to share your vision today, and you're going to make us also ambassadors of Paraguay's vision for the region. So welcome, and I leave you in this amazing conversation with our president and CEO, Ambassador Mark Green, who, by the way, is a true believer of what can be achieved when you have long-term pro-business sound policies that allow the provision of welfare for those in need. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Uh, let me uh, join my vo voice to Ivan Duque, Benjamin Gadan, uh, Bill Brownfield, Ambassador Brownfield, it is great to have you here as always, uh, one of our leaders. I think it is a clear sign that there is no region more important to the Wilson Center than Latin America, and in particular, uh, your part of the world. So it is uh, great to welcome you here. As you've heard from uh, both of those who introduced you, um, we see a, a sense of optimism in your country only surpassed by your ambitions for your country. You have a very ambitious agenda. Uh, and what are your first priority? Well, first off, 60 days in, I know you're already getting to work, you made clear. But in coming weeks, what are your top priorities? What do you want to work on? Good morning, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, after hearing Ivan and um, Benjamin, uh, I thought maybe I should leave. Right? <laughs> it, it could not get any better after both introductions. Thank Believe you Believe me, much. they don't say that about everyone. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to come back to the Wilson Center, uh, who has received me always very kindly, to bring the voice of a relatively small country, unknown country, uh, to outreach uh, the, the business, the diplomatic community here uh, in Washington. It's always a pleasure, and I really enjoy this. Uh, coming back uh, and seeing a lot of uh, friendly faces uh, is, is great for me. Uh, I lived three years in Washington, uh, and I really enjoy uh, the experience and how all these institutions, national and international institutions, uh, confluence here uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, it has been a great experience, uh, a roller coaster for me and my team for the last 60 days. It has been great. Uh, with all the experience that I had accumulated despite my youth, uh, I'm only 44, but working so much in, in Paraguay uh, and seeing so much what has happened in Paraguay in recent years, it only uh, fueled with enthusiasm on all the things that we could do. And, and our main objective is how can we uh, share this? How can we convince the business community, the diplomatic community, why this country that is so unknown for many people around the world, it matters. It, it matters for the region, it matters for the world. What Paraguay can offer uh, is uh, a great experience on, on things. The, the way should not be done and the way should be done. Uh, I think that what we are living today and after the, the election in Paraguay in April of this year, it was the, the most uh, scrutinized election in the history of Paraguay and it was uh, uh, a lot of participation, and the results were 
uh, just great. Uh, it, it shows how democracy is working in, in a country that suffered the lack of democracy for many, many years. And, and we can now compare 35 years of dictatorship with 35 years of democracy, and, and the results are astonishingly better under democracy. Democracy that today is under attack in, in many parts of the world, and, and many societies are suffering uh, anxiety, are suffering of polarization, uh, not knowing what is true and what is not true, uh, and we think that Paraguay has a, a lot to offer in this. So, uh, what is that I, I want to achieve in the coming month is I want to reach, I want to raise the voice uh, on, on the peace in Russia and Ukraine because Paraguay 150 years ago, it suffered of an invasion of a larger country. We, we lost 60% of the territory, 90% of the male population. Uh, but more importantly, we lost an opportunity. Uh, for, for many, many years, Paraguay was an open grave. Uh, and, and lose the track of development and uh, the impact on human capital was terrible. And so we cannot stay silent in, in this conflict. And, and the same again uh, after the terrorist attacks on Israel. Uh, we have raised our voice and uh, we are calling for, for peace. This is, I think, that something uh, that the world is, is looking. And, and we are in the middle of integration. Paraguay, as a landlocked country, is proving that being a landlocked and being next to large countries, uh, th there is an option, uh, there is an opportunity, and, and we want to prove this to, to the region and the rest of the world. Yeah, Mr. President, uh, when you talk about uh, your ambitions and your hope for the future, I'm struck by the clear mandate that you received at the election. So uh, majority in both houses, majority of the, clear majority of the governorships, it's really quite striking. It seems to me that at the heart of your platform was your promise to create half a million jobs in your country over five years in a region where there has been slow growth. Uh, how do you get there? What are your plans to make that come alive for your people? It's a, a lot of, uh, you need to have a lot of patience. You have to be convinced and, and you need, to, you require uh, some type of skills. And I said, uh, teaching skills. You need to have the patience of teach, uh, talking a lot of people, but not in the way of lecturing. You were a member of parliament in, mm. in the past, right? Uh, he, I was minister of finance at the age of 35. So I thought that I knew all the answers. Uh, and I went to Congress many times asking for the approval of law, budgets, and many other initiatives. Uh, and, and at some point I said, I, I need to give them the view, the broader view about how things uh, will evolve. How will Paraguay will move from uh, a development stage with a more, to a more sustainable and development uh, position. So uh, I remember I gathered all the economic uh, commission, uh, the budget commission, which is the, the most important, and for an hour I gave a a lecture, a presentation about uh, development. And I said, if we follow this pace, Paraguay will be uh, an advanced economy. And after the hour, one of the member of parliament said, and how many votes do you have? And I said, I, I don't get it. Uh, I'm the Minister of Finance. Yeah, you have one vote, the vote of confidence that the president gave you. Do you have any idea how hard I work to be here? Do you know how many people I have to convince? And now you're coming with a nice suit and a PowerPoint telling me what to do? It doesn't work that way. Go out, talk to people. When the people trust you, then you're going to be able to do the thing. So that, uh, for someone who has never been involved in politics, I, I decided that knowing how policy works, knowing how politics works, it doesn't matter if you're not able to convince other people. So I went out uh, at the age of 38. I campaigned for many, many months. Uh, I couldn't convince the majority, but I convinced a large number of people how putting the dots together, it will take us from where we are to where we want to be. So when I lost in 2017, uh, I said this should not be uh, a, a short uh, career, this is a long career. So I decided to continue to, to follow this pace. So I, I campaign against populism, I, and I explain the, the danger of populism, how this has uh, harmed public policy in many parts of the world. I, I campaign against polarization. Uh, and as Benjamin was telling, uh, I'm part of a very uh, large political party 
the Colorado Party holds 55% of all the electoral votes in Paraguay. All, and when you put together the two main parties, 80% of all the voters are affiliated to a political party. This is the largest number in the world. So I, I gave a twist to the, the political speech, the traditional political speech. Is I'm not only going to solve the problem, but I'm going to show you how we together we're going to solve the problem. So uh, in, in, and I enjoy this. I, I think this is the, the great part of it. Uh, I, I enjoy doing this. And over the last couple of months, uh, we have been able not only to have the approval by Congress, but understanding how important and how this is part of a larger view on the development of Paraguay. It's not only using the clean renewable energy, but it's also creating new sources of clean energy uh, for the future, or how we're going to uh, scale up our investment in human capital, in health, in education, and how is this will allow in the future uh, to uh, make life better. The, the good thing of this, or uh, I know that many people, and we keep repeating this, uh, we don't know a lot of Paraguay. The truth is that we Paraguayan didn't know a lot about Paraguay. We didn't have the numbers to uh, reflect on, on the things that we have and the things that we want to do. Uh, and uh, we were discussing about this uh, green, green transition on clean economy. Uh, and the truth is that it was only a couple of weeks ago that we announced that we have the numbers, hard numbers, that shows that 92% of all the soy, Paraguay is one of the largest soy producers in the world, is our main crop. 92% of all the soy that is produced in Paraguay is not coming from a forest that was deforestated. 92%. Nobody knew about this. So uh, even there was a movie uh, recently that um, there was a conversation between a mother and a daughter, and the daughter said, no, I'm not, uh, I'm vegan, I'm eating uh, soy. Yeah, but you know that that soy is coming from uh, deforestation in Paraguay. Uh, so it was his thought that Paraguay was uh, dilapidating the uh, natural resources, which is not true. We are developing and we're making in a way that is sustainable, and we didn't know in, in the past. Mm. Um, you know, Mr. President, uh, your country is already an agricultural uh, powerhouse, and you talked about it a little bit, but a pulp mill, a green energy agenda. What do you see as some of the most promising non-agricultural sectors for your country? Industry. Industry, and, and there is no shortcut for development. We know that the development of industry is uh, what makes a uh, higher uh, value added, it allows uh, better jobs. So industry is something that uh, we are working very hard. Uh, and our main trading partner, which is Brazil, has teamed up with us. They, they are convinced on this view. Um, we have uh, legislation which is very similar to what uh, Mexico have with the U.S., a maquila regime. So this did not exist 10 years ago. Uh, today we are exporting a billion dollars per year to Brazil. Uh, one third of it is auto parts, uh, wire harnesses for the auto industry in, in Brazil. One third uh, is coming from textile, and, and the rest is distributing between uh, plastic industry, uh, food processing, and I think that this is uh, going to increase very, very rapidly in, in coming years. Uh, of course, this depends from time to time on the view, uh, mostly from Brazil. Uh, and I have uh, this huge privilege uh, working with President Lula, who has in the past so uh, a great view for integration, um, has allowed us, uh, for both of us to start very, very fast. And, and this is, I think, one of the beauty about politics. When, when you see his profile and you compare with my profile, uh, there is absolutely no coincidence, right? What, what we would call strange bedfellow. Yes. Uh, so... But it's amazing how we were able to uh, share this common view for the future. If we were to see our backgrounds, uh, there's very little in common. But when we think about our common view on integration, a uh, Brazil that should play a, a leading role, not only in the region, but in the world, and how this leading role should also lift up the countries in the region, uh, I, I feel very, very optimistic, not only on the things that we could do in integration, 
but more importantly, what we could achieve in the renegotiation of the Itaipu Treaty. And, and my take there uh, was, is that 50 years ago, Paraguayans and Brazilians, they were discussing uh, a, a limit, it was a limit discussion coming from the war in 1870. They, we never solved the, the limits. So they sat together and they agreed, okay, we're not gonna agree on the limit, but because the limits are on the middle of the river, we're gonna make a huge dam in the middle of the river. So 50 years ago, they agreed on building this huge dam, not only building, operating jointly, but also paying off 100% of the debt. So I, I said to him, I'm amazed, I'm surprised what we were able to achieve. The question is, what is that we are going to do today that in 50 years' time people will feel amazed about ourselves? And I saw the blink of his eyes. <laughs> he, he took the idea and he said, let's do it. Let's make it not only clean energy, but let's make it the source of development for our countries. So for Paraguay, teaming up with the eighth largest economy in the world, uh, and also in a world that is lacking leadership, because it's true, we are lacking leadership. One of the problems that we are facing in, in our time is the lack of leadership at this stage. And I think that he is a great leader for the region and, and for Paraguay. It's, it's a gr great opportunity. Uh, Mr. President, you also will be in the right place at the right time as the presidency of Mercosur comes to uh, Paraguay. Uh, you have an unabashed pro-trade, pro-foreign investment agenda. What do you see that that presidency can do? Uh, let me put it this way. What can the presidency uh, do for Paraguay, but also what can Paraguay do for the presidency in the region? Uh, we, need to, we need to move to a more ambitious agenda. Uh, and I think that uh, being president of Mercosur would be a great opportunity for me to, to put all my, my energy, uh, mostly my energy and, and my experience, uh, to lead uh, a process of integration outside of the region. Uh, for 25 years, almost 30 years, we have concentrated all of our efforts in one agreement, which is the EU. It is an important agreement. I, I hope that we can achieve. But I think that it's time to move forward. Uh, I think that the war has developed in a way that there are other um, a commercial uh, agreements that need to be uh, taken. Uh, I would love to advance with the Emirates. I think that the Emirates is uh, showing not only being the, the point of entrance for the Middle East, but for the entire world. Uh, the, the type of logistic that they have developed is amazing. I think that for Mercosur, we, we have a great match. Uh, Singapore also uh, has proven to be a, a very dynamic economy uh, and being a source, a platform for development. So I think that uh, for Paraguay, that's, that would be great to, to move forward, to advance in, in trade discussion with other uh, trading partners. I hope that we can close before the end of the year with the EU. If not, uh, I will move the, the following semester in, in engaging with other regions. Uh, also, Paraguay distinctive in your formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan, only country uh, on that continent. What do you see as the opportunities that can come with that close working relationship with Taiwan? I went to Taipei um, in in the early 2000s. I was um, a young uh, economist. You're uh, still young. I was, yeah, I was <laughs> younger. I was much younger. And, and I was, uh, remember, coming from the islands surrounded by land, a country completely isolated. Uh, and I found a country full of opportunities, uh, uh, people so energetic. And I found the history uh, so passionate, uh, what they were living, uh, the the immigration from uh, mainland China coming to the island of Formosa and, and all the tension that went through uh, since then. So I was very uh, impressed with the drive. Uh, this notion that uh, it doesn't matter whether you are a large country in terms of territory or whether you have 
uh, a big population, you still can be a very developed nation. So that starts to, to develop uh, uh, a lot of questions inside of me. And, and then when I, when I came to Washington uh, uh, working for the IMF, I, I traveled a lot through Africa. I worked on the African department. Uh, and I saw, again, uh, a huge, uh, very sad experience and, and the influence of uh, other nations in trying to influence this, this continent. So that mixture, what Taiwan was doing and what mainland China was doing, uh, it, it created this combined view that Paraguay should follow the path of Taiwan. Uh, it had nothing to do with geopolitics. It had nothing to do with the U.S. is supporting mm -hmm. Taiwan. This is good for Paraguay. Uh, similar to uh, Taiwan, similar to the experience of uh, South Korea, also to a complicated neighbor, but also uh, was able to endure hardship. And, and also similar to what is happening in Israel, also a small country next to to large and complex countries. That, for me, is, is the path for Paraguay. Paraguay has a path for being not only a developed country, but probably being the most developed country. I think that Paraguay matters, and not only for the region, but matters for the entire world, more than people think about. Uh, when we think about logistics and the bioceanics or the waterway connecting five countries that goes through the middle of Paraguay, or when we think about energy transition, when we think about uh, technology and how Paraguay can be at the center uh, and a hub for a world world uh, center for uh, data storage and cybersecurity, uh, I think that there is a, a big opportunity. So uh, I'm convinced uh, about our relation with Taiwan, which is based not on trade, it's based on values, it's based on, on a common vision of how important is human capital, how important is to train uh, the, your population. And, and it doesn't matter how hard other countries try to develop the semiconductor industry. Still today, 85% of all the semiconductors mm. are produced in that tiny island. Mm. Uh, you're also um, president at a time of opportunity, given the emphasis on friend shoring and near shoring in modern economics. I think, uh, particularly in the U.S., um, challenges like COVID laid bare for us, vulnerabilities that we had in our supply chain. This may be an opportunity. How do you see the opportunities for Paraguay with respect to the U.S. and nearshoring and friendshoring? I think makes a lot of sense, uh, but I have to recognize, Mark, that uh, from this idea that came uh, during the pan pandemic, we had advanced very, very little. And, and I think that the world will face uh, another, uh, another stress, uh, the type of the COVID, before we realize that we need to really do it, not only say it. Uh, we are, I think that the benefit of having industries in Paraguay has nothing to do with the nearshoring, but uh, is because Paraguay is showing that it can produce better product on a more efficient way. This is not cheap production, this is efficiency. Uh, and the efficiency is coming from a combination of macro stability, uh, a friendly tax regime, uh, and also uh, the improvement of human capital. So uh, I think that Paraguay uh, will, will be making uh, more headlines in, in coming years and this will show also that the, the center of integration will be uh, in the heart of South America in Paraguay. Uh, economics clearly at the heart of your agenda and at the heart of your mandate, but it's about more than economics. You also have talked a great deal about combating organized crime and organized crime, corruption, and uh, narcotics. How do you see... Uh, your agenda with respect to tackling uh, crime and corruption in government? Uh, in terms of corruption, and this is a, an endemic problem, this is something that we need to work on. And, and Paraguay has shown that when all institutions, and I said all institutions, I, I mentioned Congress, uh, the judiciary system work together, there is nothing that we cannot achieve. Um, uh, last year, Paraguay, 
uh, went through the evaluation of the Financial Action Task Force on AML, anti-money laundering evaluation. And uh, we can find in all the reports about the Triple Alliance and how the, the Triple, uh, the Tri-Border area and how is the center smuggling and all that. But the truth is that after being subject to the evaluation, Paraguay got the same qualification as Uruguay and Chile in terms of the legislation, but the efficiency of the legislation, how many people has been prosecuted, how many people has been uh, in jail. So, uh, and this has been done thanks to a, a, a joint effort by all the branches of power. So I, I, I got in my, my oath on August 15, uh, uh, on a Tuesday, on the Sunday, I invited the, the head of all, all the uh, branches, head of Congress, head of the, the Supreme Court, and the Controller General, and the Attorney General, and I said, we're going to face this together. Corruption is an endemic problem in our society. It's a cultural problem, and we need to face this together. And, and we signed a, an agreement that uh, by November 24th, next month, we're going to launch a national strategy on anti-corruption uh, by all power, uh, all institutions working working together. We have also the, the international community supporting us. So this is something uh, that I'm convinced that we can uh, improve very, very rapidly. The, the legislation that is needed, but the implementation and the coordination that is crucial for this. Uh, in a similar way, we address the issue of security, and security we have to divide in two, the, the urban and internal security, and then the border, uh, and the more related to uh, international crimes, uh, mostly drug trafficking. Internally, uh, we are uh, improving the capacity of the police officer. We are tripling uh, the forces of uh, what is called the Lince. Lince is something that we got the experience from Panama. These are uh, a special unit that works in urban areas and, and in the past proved to be uh, very e efficient. We are tripling the capacity of this force. Uh, and we are also, uh, and we identify one of the main sources of insecurity was coming from the jails. So uh, a overpopulation in the jails. We are now finishing uh, three new jails and this will allow us to improve the security inside of the of the jails and this will allow to also to improve the security outside of the jails and in terms of um, international uh, fight and the coordination uh, on friday uh, we are uh, signing an agreement with brazil uh, uh, in a very broad cooperation agenda in terms of security and, and the fight against drug trafficking which is one of the uh, biggest problem paraguay is not a producer of cocaine, and most of the cocaine that has been found in Europe in recent years went through Paraguay. Uh, that's why it's, it's so important, the work that we need to do uh, uh, through the waterway, because uh, this is coming uh, up north, is coming uh, to Paraguay, is uh, coming very easily through the borders, and, and then is mixed uh, with legal products that Paraguay is exporting to the rest of the world. So uh, we need to improve, and, and we are uh, working very closely with the U.S. and also with Brazil in this, in this regard. Uh, I'm going to turn uh, to Benjamin Gadan to moderate some audience questions, but one last question I'd like to ask you. Uh, you indicated that during your time here in D.C. you hoped to meet, plan to meet with members of Congress. Music to my ears. Uh, what's your message? to members of Congress, Republicans, and Democrats? Paraguay matters. Paraguay matters to the U.S. more than they know, and, and we need to raise uh, this issue. Uh, the region is a source of huge opportunity, but without their proper attention, it could be a source of instability in the future. Uh, there are countries uh, that have holding the fort, uh, have macro stability, solid uh, democratic conviction, but there are other countries that are suffering of macro stability, and this macro stability, instability, make them very vulnerable, very vulnerable to countries outside of the region which have uh, a different view about the world. So um, I think. Paraguay uh, is, is a country that has been uh, many, many years 
aligned with the U.S. And, and one of our main problems is that we had not been a problem for many years. Uh, but this is good in some way, but it's bad in other ways because uh, we are now in the middle of a region that is becoming very vulnerable and, and very stable. And I think we need to work together in this regard. Uh, Benjamin, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Many thanks. I welcome your questions now to participate in this exciting conversation. Let me take just one second also to thank and welcome members of the cabinet who are here joining us. We have the ministers of commerce, the minister of environment, of science and technology. We have the cabinet chief. Thank you so much for being here as well at the Wilson Center. The ambassador from Costa Rica has joined us. Welcome, ambassador. Please join our conversation. Yes. One sec, if you would just use the microphone and please briefly introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, uh, John Dixon of the uh, Global Peace Foundation. I uh, think your relationship with Taiwan is very, very important and critical. And, and I'm just curious if you get pressure from other, from the neighborhood uh, to, about keeping that because you're all alone with it. And uh, again, it's incredibly important and noble. And what's it like uh, for you, for, for Paraguay, to, to maintain that relationship? Um, thank you very much, John. Uh, we are not only alone in the region, we are getting alone in the world. Uh, Paraguay is, is by far the largest country that continues to support uh, Taiwan. And, and we, we need to know why we do this. And we are not doing this for the interests of other regions. We are doing this because of our own interests because uh, we have suffered uh, lack of democracy. We know that democracy is at risk. So uh, with Taiwan, we share uh, democracy uh, values, democratic values. Uh, so uh, the other thing is that we, and I myself, I'm, I'm very open about the things that I believe on. Uh, my relation and, and the relation with Taiwan was a hot topic uh, during the campaign. Uh, the, the other candidate was campaigning on leaving Taiwan and saying we need to go to, to China. And so I, I make the argument why it doesn't make a, any sense if, if we were to. And we do trade with China. We have no restrictions. Actually, in fact, we buy most of our products that come to Paraguay come from China. And we sell products to China. But, and this is, and we have a study based on, on this, that if we were to do more trade with China, uh, that trade is going to be based on raw materials and not on industrial materials. So uh, I explained to you, if we want to be an uh, industrial-like country, uh, and that's the path for development, there's no shortcut for development. We need to go to the industrialization process. Taiwan is a better option uh, for us. Uh, and I, I was very open because I have this conversation with all the countries in the region. I had with Brazil, with Argentina, with Uruguay. And I was very open from the beginning. This is no under negotiation. So if Mercosur wants to have an agreement with China, free trade agreement, we are not going to be any opposition for it. But we are not going to leave our relation of 60 years with Taiwan. As, as we await our, our next question. Thank you. President Peña, I wanted to ask, in the presence of your foreign minister, uh, another foreign policy question, which is the relationship with Israel. You've spoken about that frequently over the years, um, in particular related to the location of the Paraguayan embassy moving from Tel Aviv back to Jerusalem. But more broadly, I wonder if you could talk a bit about what's happening now. It's obviously on the minds of many here. We at the Wilson Center are doing an extraordinary amount of work on the conflict right now, taking place in southern Israel and in Gaza. I wonder if you could talk a bit about this, what you've described as a of leadership in the world and how it might be applied to that particular conflict and, and what role you might play in addressing the violence in the Middle East. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, this also has been a, a source of a, a lot of debate. Uh, Paraguay, for many, many years, is not new, has a very close relation with Israel, uh, much closer than any other country in, in the region, and we're very open about this. Uh, six years ago, the administration took the decision, and it was a bold decision, uh, to move the embassy uh, to Jerusalem. And, and there was a lot of uh, things behind that. And it was nothing to do on personal relations, which helped. Personal relations are always good. We have uh, a great relation with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. But even when he was out of uh, the Prime Minister's office, we said that we're going to move the, the embassy back. And, and the reason behind this is, is the following. 
Similar to uh, Israel, who has uh, went through endurance and hardship, we also have a history of endurance and hardship. Uh, and, and I think that it, this is not bad. We have to embrace it uh, sometimes. And, and Paraguay has this uh, history of being a country uh, at the verge of the extinction. Uh, and in fact, it was Colombia who, after the war, issued uh, a law saying that no Paraguayan will be a paria. And from the moment they step into Colombia, they will get all the, uh, the, the benefits of being a, a Colombian. So Paraguay was at the verge of, being, of disappearing. Uh, and we have not disappeared. And we have been in this process of, of recovery. So we think that uh, Israel uh, has the same testimony as, as we have. And, and we really enjoy uh, seeing how in, in this very unstable region they are able to to uh, to go through, I have to recognize that we feel a bit a little bit jealous uh, because the type of support that Israel received, the type of support that Taiwan received, mostly from the U.S., is not not the type of support that Paraguay has received since the end of the war in 1870. So, but we don't let lose our faith. Maybe <laughs> at some point they will realize that Paraguay really matters. Uh, and again, uh, we we base our relation with uh, with Israel uh, based on on democratic uh, values. Faith is not a minor issue. Uh, Paraguay is mostly uh, a Catholic. Uh, more than ninety percent of the population is Catholic. Uh, so uh, our identity and our roots, of course, come from uh, the Judaism. So uh, this is also something that is is very very important. But when we think about uh, a small country with no natural resources, uh, but they base it uh, on human capital, the knowledge, the source of development, this is the type of things that we want to do Paraguay. Of course we recognize Paraguay is a powerhouse in clean renewable energy. Of course we recognize we are a powerhouse on food production. But the source of development that is going to take Paraguay from 6,000 GDP per capita to 40 or 50,000 GDP per capita is not going to be only clean energy, low taxes, and food production. It's going to be high value products, technology, innovation. This is the type of development that we envision for Paraguay for the next 50 years. President Peña, we're in Washington, so let's talk more about the relationship between Asuncion and Washington. You've mentioned areas of cooperation, including on anti corruption, on counterterrorism, finance not on trade. And I heard the list that you came up with where Mercosur maybe moves beyond discussions exclusively focused on the EU. You mentioned the United Arab Emirates. You mentioned Singapore. What are the prospects for deeper commercial ties, deeper trade ties between the United States and Paraguay? I think there's a lot that we could do. Uh, but we, I think that we are in a, in a stage where we have lost our faith in, in how fast we can move. Uh, for for over a, cent, a, a decade, we have been hoping that Paraguay regain access to the beef market. We are sure that uh, Paraguay has an excellent beef production, sustainable beef, high quality and very competitive. Uh, but we're still waiting for the U.S. to reopen the beef market for Paraguay. Uh, we think that Paraguay offers a lot of produ a lot of options for this uh, near shoring for the U.S. Uh, but I think that. Our main challenge is how, how we move the image of Paraguay from the U.S. business community. And, and this is one of the things that we are also uh, doing. We spent in the past a lot of time engaging with the State Department, which is very important, and we'll continue to do this. But we don't pay attention to uh, the business community. Paraguay was the last country in South America to issue bonds in the international market, the last one. And I remember having a discussion with an asset manager and saying, oh, you know, all this beauty about Paraguay. And said, you know, Minister, Paraguay doesn't exist. What do you mean doesn't exist? Mm. Le, here it is, in the, market, <laughs> in, the, in the map, in the heart of South America. And let me show you. And he opened his computer, uh, his Bloomberg platform. Mm. He typed Paraguay, uh, pressed enter, and said, not found. <laughs> Paraguay did not exist. Uh, so... We are doing this job of outreaching market. Uh, we are doing this job in outreaching the business community. And we are doing this job, and I think it's one of the things that we need to do the most, is engaging with the, with the politics community. 
that is in Congress. This is something that we haven't done. We've never done it. Mm. Uh, and this is something uh, I think that we create a lot of benefits. So the view is, while we continue to improve in human capital, strength in institution, we need to close the gap between reality and perception. There is a dynamic uh, and a, a inertia that people say, oh, you know, Paraguay, this uh, country is in the past and, you know, in the middle of nowhere. No, we are in the middle of integration. We are in the middle of where things are going to be happening in, in the next coming years. Other questions for President Peña? Yes, please. Hi, um, Harold Penchina, I'm with CSIS. Um, I wanted to ask you on green hydrogen. Um, really complex supply chains, really new. Uh, what has been the hardest hurdle in terms of that? And what's been easy? I know that's a very clean grid and that makes it for easier, but also with this like international projection of Paraguay, uh, how does green hydrogen play on that? And I mean, given yesterday's uh, results, Massa, Milei, for Paraguay, what does this mean? Um, and yeah. And, and maybe if I could say, since we're running out of time, let's have a broader environmental agenda. Yeah. This would be a great moment to discuss your efforts to control deforestation as well, even as you expand food production. I know that's a lot, but we want to yeah. take advantage of your time. No, no, no. I, I think it's, it's great on and, and the more broader agenda. And, and I think one, one of the advantages of Paraguay is that since our process of development is lagging behind the rest of the countries, we cannot do it. We can do it on the right way. We have it more information compared to other countries what they have uh, 30, 40 years ago. So the type of agricultural production that is being done in Paraguay, uh, the direct harvesting, uh, this is something that is developing in many parts of the world. But in Paraguay, because uh, the harvesting of soy began 30 years ago. This is direct harvesting. It means that they know where to put the seed and they know where to put the fertilizer and they have mapped 100% of the, uh, the harvest. So this makes it much more efficient. Uh, as I mentioned in recent weeks, we launched the, the, the study that proved that 92% of all the soy that is being produced is coming from land that was not deforestated. Uh, that was uh, already uh, free of forests and it was a change of, on the use of, of the land. So this, of course, continue to be the norm. And, and as we move forward on our green agenda, we are being more rigorous and, and being more uh, rigorous on the sanctions that we apply for uh, any crimes in, against the, the environment. On, on clean hydrogen, it's happening in Paraguay. Uh, there are already companies building plants. Uh, the main use is not for, for fuel. Uh, the main use is for green fertilizer, uh, urea is something that is uh, being produced. And, and of course, logistics is not a problem because the use is in the region. Uh, and the conflict, of course, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, of course, we are completely against, but it has also complicated the uh, supply of fertilizers. So this makes the, the business case uh, more, uh, makes a, a stronger case uh, for production. So this is going to happen. And, and uh, we think as uh, the technology advance and we move uh, to a, a greener, a greener uh, um, transport, I think that uh, hydrogen will be a, a big source. Paraguay, of course, has the, the clean energy and have water. Uh, and despite people not understanding yet, and Paraguay doesn't understand yet, that Despite being a landlock, we are surrounded by huge rivers. Uh, the, the, the size of these rivers are tremendous. Uh, so not only they produce energy, that, but they allow us to mobilize all the goods and the possibility to generate new sources of energy. Part of the question was about the impacts on Paraguay of the election in, in Argentina. Maybe I could broaden it and, and question about basic coordination opportunities in South America. Regional integration is a priority of yours. It's been difficult historically in Latin America, particularly in South America, when the 
political, partisan, and ideological constellation of actors doesn't quite line up. There is a real possibility that Argentina elects a new president who might not see eye to eye with the president of Brazil, for example. That is the ballast of South America and of Mercosur. And when that relationship doesn't function, Mercosur and, and the Southern Cone tend to have a great difficulty on collaboration. What's the role of the smaller but important members of that community, and in this case, Paraguay, in making sure that no matter what happens in Argentina, this regional integration project continues to advance. Uh, I can assure you, Benjamin, that uh, no matter what happens and who is elected, we're going to advance on integration. Uh, I have a, a lot of optimism, but I'm, I'm the son of a, an Argentinian, mm -hmm. so uh, I know Argentinians very well. Uh, I have two brothers who were born in Argentina. They went to school in Argentina. So uh, for us, uh, we, we have Argentina very close to our heart. Uh, we suffer when Argentina uh, suffered, uh, but the reality is that it, it doesn't make any difference who is elected. They have uh, a huge challenges, uh, macro instability, and, and they need to address by, by themselves. And, and it's hard. It's hard when you have to ma make adjustments uh, to spending, to uh, tax collection is, is not easy. But the truth is uh, that Argentina is such a wonderful country. It was such blessed with... Uh, so much natural resources, and, and I think they have, they are the source of the problem, but they also have the source of the solution. It's, it's just up to them. But it's not going to affect the process of integration. Of course, uh, we could do much more, but the, the, the beauty of all this is that they had been going through difficult times, and the process of uh, integration has been going backward, that we are not counting on them. So uh, uh, I would love to make more products from Paraguay and sell it to Argentina, but uh, it's going to be very hard, uh, and, and no matter who, who is elected. Um, but I hope that they can solve the, the internal problems, and, and again, they, they find a way uh, every time. President Peña, we have run out of time here. This has been an extraordinarily helpful conversation. We have never doubted Paraguay's importance, whatever the Bloomberg terminal might have said in the past. Um, what you say is absolutely correct, and I think demonstrably so, that what happens in Paraguay matters in the region, matters in the world. Issues of food security, energy security, nearshoring, strengthening global supply chains, bringing manufacturing as you industrialize, protecting forests while increasing production of soy and beef working on environmental protection more broadly and green hydrogen. It's an impressive list. It's a bold agenda, not to mention 500,000 new jobs, as Ambassador Green has, has reminded you of your campaign promise. Um, but we see you moving quickly, still looking and feeling youthful and energetic, and we appreciate that. We hope four and plus years from now, you'll um, have a long list of achievements and the same energy and optimism. Please join me in thanking President Pena for this extraordinary opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you.